In part A of question one, the modal class is the class with the highest frequency. Now the highest frequency is 27, so this is the modal class. For part B, I need to estimate the mean number of days. Now the formula for the mean is the following. The denominator of this formula is the sum of all the frequencies, in our case 100, and the numerator, sigma fx, is the sum of all the multiplications of number of days times frequency. Now, for the number of days, I don't have a fixed number, I have an interval, so the most representative number is the midpoint of each class. I'm going to call this x. The midpoint for the first class is 2, for the second one is 6, and then I've got 10, 14, and 18. And then I'm going to multiply this midpoint by the frequency, which I'm going to call f. So since I'm multiplying f by x, I will label this column as fx. And I've got 32, 108, 190, 378 and 360, and when I find the sum of this column, this will be 1068. Recall, I'm doing this multiplication because multiplying the x times the f is like grouping the additions. So my mean is gonna be 1068 over 100, and this will give me 10.68 days. In question two, I've got two prisms and I need to find the difference in their volumes. So let's first start by calculating the volume of shape A. Now the cross section is a right angle triangle. So I've got base times height over two times the length of this prism. So six times six over two times five will give me 90. That's for shape A. For shape B, the cross-section is a semicircle, so I've got pi r squared over 2 times the length of the prism. So pi times 3 squared over 2 times the length, which is 5. This will give me 45 over 2 pi. That's approximately 70.7. So the difference is 90 minus 45 over 2 pi, and this will give me an answer of 19.3. In question 3, part A, I've got a sequence of numbers. Note that every time I'm adding 6 to get to the next one. So this is an arithmetic sequence, and the general formula for the nth term of an arithmetic sequence is the following, where A is the first term and D is the difference. In our case, A is equal to 10 and D is equal to 6. So let's substitute these values in and we get the following, 10 plus n minus 1 times 6. If I expand, I get 10 plus 6n minus 6. And if I simplify, I get 6n plus 4. For part B, I've got another sequence given by n squared minus 3. I need to find the number that appears in both sequences. Now, one approach is to equate the nth term for both sequences. So I'm going to do n squared minus 3 equals 6n plus 4. This is quadratic. I'm going to collect everything on one side. n squared minus 6n minus 3 minus 4, which gives me minus 7, equals 0. And then I'll factorize n minus 7 is the first bracket, n plus 1 is the second one. So n is 7 or n is minus 1, but n, which is the position of each term, cannot be negative. So n is equal to 7, which implies that the seventh term of each sequence is 46. You can get that by substituting 7 into either the left or the right of this equation. 
Alternatively, you can create a table of values for sequence T and see which value appears in both sequences. Let's do that. So if I substitute one, two, three, four, and so on into the general term of sequence T, I'm gonna get minus two, one, six, 13, 22. 22 appears in the first sequence as well. So there's no need for me to continue. 22 is a valid answer. So my final answer could be either 22 or 46. In question four, I have a percentage increase of 7%, which means that the multiplying factor is 107 over 100 or as a decimal 1.07. So I'm going to have my initial value times my multiplying factor and this will give me the final value which is the answer I'm trying to find. In this question I'm given the position of a hall and the position of a library. A post box is 140 meters from the library and a bearing of 220. Now note that using the given scale, 20 meters are represented by one centimeter. So 140 meters are represented by seven centimeters. Also recall that a bearing is measured clockwise from the north. If your protractor only goes from 0 to 180, then you can use 360 minus 220, which is 140 degrees anticlockwise from the north. So let's go and draw this line. Once you draw this line, take your ruler and measure a distance of 7 centimeters. And that's where point P is located. For part B, I'll use the scale drawing to find the real distance from the hole to the post office and the bearing of the hole from the post box. So let's join the hole and point P. Now if you use a ruler and measure this distance from hole to point P, it comes out to be 7.7 .7 centimeters. So since one centimeter is equal to 20 meters, then 7.7 .7 centimeters are equal to 154 meters. Note that the mark scheme accepts any answer from 150 up to 158 meters. To find the bearing of the hole from the post box, I'll need to draw the north at point P. The angle we need to measure is the one starting from the north at point P and going clockwise until you point to the hole. So this is the angle we want. Now you can't measure this angle because your protractor goes only from zero to 180, you can measure this angle and subtract it from 360. Now be careful because when you are doing the north, then the direction was a bit subjective. So if you're not confident whether your north is indeed vertical, you can measure this angle using your protractor. And when I did, it came out to be 152 degrees. So since these angles are interior angles, then the small one came out to be 28 degrees. So the bearing of the hole from the post box is 360 minus 28 degrees, which is 332 degrees. Note the mark scheme accepts anything from 330 to 334. In question six, I've got two polygons, a regular octagon and a non-regular pentagon. I'll use the formula for the sum of the interior angles that states the following. 
sum of interior angles of a polygon is equal n minus 2 times 180. Now, the fact that the pentagon has exactly one line of symmetry means that I can split this into two equal parts like this. Hence, the two angles at the base are equal. Let's label this as y. So I've got y on the left, y on the right. And now let's proceed and use this formula for the pentagon. So we've got 84 plus 112 plus 112 plus y plus y is equal to 5 minus 2 times 180. I'm using the formula shaded in blue. So 308 plus 2y is equal to 540, which means that 2y is equal to 232. y comes out to be 116. Now the octagon is a regular one, so to find each interior angle of the octagon, I will apply the same formula and then divide by 8. So each interior is equal to 8 minus 2 times 180 over 8, which comes out to be 135. Hence, x is equal to 135 minus the value of y, which comes out to be 19. For question 7, I'll divide the trapezium into a rectangle and a right angle triangle like this. I will extract the right angle triangle and work with that. The angle at the top is 125 minus 90, so it's 35 degrees. I'll call the base x and the height is equal to 15. So in order to find x, I'll do tan of 35 equals opposite. That's x over adjacent side, which is 15. So x is equal to 15 tan of 35, which comes out to be 10.503 and so on. So to find y, this is simply 37 plus the value of x, which comes out to be 47.503. 5 to 1 decimal place. For part A of question 8, I will divide the two numbers. So 15 divided by 5 comes out to be 3. Then for the letters, I will just subtract the powers because I have division. So k to the 4 divided by k to the 1, that is k to the power of 3. And then m to the power of 3 divided by m squared is simply m to the power of 1 or just m. For part B, to solve this inequality, I will first split it into two. Now, the blue part is 7 less than 4x minus 1, which is 8 less than 4x, which is 8 over 4, 2 less than x. And then for the red part, I've got 4x minus 1 less than or, than or equal to 17. Take the one to the other side. 4x is less than or equal to 18. x is less than or equal to 18 divided by 4. That's 9 over 2. And if I merge these two, I'm going to get 2 less than x, less than or equal to 9 over 2. For question 9, my multiplying factor will be equal to 101.5, that's 100 plus 1.5 percent, over 100 as a decimal. This is 1.015. Then the final amount would be equal to the original amount times my multiplying factor to the power of 4. This comes out to be 6,368. 18. So the interest will be equal to the final amount minus the original amount. So I've got 6,368.18 minus 6,000. So I've got 368 to the nearest 
dirham for the interest. For part A of this question, the power of 1 over 2 applies to all three terms 16, x to the 8, y to the 6. So let's write this down, 16 to the power of 1 over 2 times x to the 8 to the 1 over 2 times y to the 6 to the 1 over 2. Now the first one, 16 to the power of 1 over 2 is just 4. Then for the other two, I'll have to multiply the powers so I get x to the power of 4, y to the power of 3. For part b, I'll convert this to the same denominator, so I'm going to multiply the first one by 2, so 2 times 8 minus 2x minus, I'm going to multiply the second one by 3, and then I'll multiply the other side by 6, so I get 16 minus 4x minus 6x, and then be careful, minus times minus is plus 9 equals 24. Let's simplify. I've got 25 minus 10x is 24. I'll collect like terms. I'm going to take the 10x to the right, bring the 24 to the left, so I get 1 equals 2, 10 x, so x is equal to 1 over 10. For part c, I'll start by squaring both sides, so m squared is equal a third ef. I'll proceed with multiplying each side by 3, so 3m squared equals ef, and then to get f on its own, I will simply divide by e, and this is the final answer. In question 11, I need to show whether these two lines are perpendicular or not. Now, the rule is the following. If two lines are perpendicular, then the product of their gradients should be minus 1. So let's begin. Line 1 is x plus 2y equals 4. I'll try and leave y on its own. So 2y is minus x plus 4. So y is minus x plus 4 all over 2. And if I split this into 2, I get y equals minus a half x plus 2. So the gradient of this line is equal to minus a half. Now for the line 2, m equals 2 y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And if I substitute the values I'm given, I've got 9 minus minus 7 over 7 minus minus 1. This comes out to be 16 over 8 or 2, which is the gradient of the second line. And then note that m1 times m2 is equal to minus a half times 2, which is minus 1. So he is correct. I'll start question 12 by first arranging these values in ascending order. Then to find the interquartile range, I'll first need to find the upper quartile, the lower quartile, and find their difference. For the lower quartile, I'll just find a quarter of n, in our case, a quarter of 11, which is 2.75. Now, if I take the next positive integer position, q1 will be on the third position, and this is a value of 6. To find the upper quartile, I'll take three quarters of n, in this case, three quarters of 11. This comes out to be 8.25. So Q3 will be at the next integer position, so position 9. And this is 51. So the interquartile range is 51 minus 6, which gives me a value of 45. 
I will start question 13 by finding the ratio of the three people. So C to F to T will be, and since I'm talking about percentages, I'll start with Carlos as 100, 265, 222. This gives me a total of 287. So Carlos got a fraction of 100 over 287 of the total, and I'll multiply this by 861, and this will give me 300, which is the amount that Carlos got. Now note, I, instead of using 100 for Carlos, I could have used 1, which means that Flavia would get 0.65, and Tasia would get 1.22. In this case, the total would come out to be 2.87, and then using the same method would still give me 300 pounds. For part A, note that 3 to the 2x is equal to 3 to the x all squared, so this will be equal to a squared. And for the second one, this is 3 to the x times 3 to the 4y, which is equal to 3 to the x times 3 to the y and then to the power of 4. And this will be a times b to the power of 4. For the third part, I get 3 to the y. And because I've got subtraction, this is like dividing by 3 to the 1. And this will be equal to b over 3. For part B, I've got two equations, the blue one and the red one, and I'm going to solve these two simultaneously. Now, from the blue one, B equals 2187 over A, and I will substitute this expression into equation red. So I get A squared times 2187 over a equals to 177147. Now I'm going to cancel out the a with the square. So I'll be left with 2187a equals to the other side. So a is equal to 177147 over 2187. And a comes out to be 80. One, and if I substitute this now into this rearranged version of the blue equation, I will get B equals 2187 over 81, which gives me 27. Now, A is equal to 3 to the X, which came out to be 81, which means X is equal, and by trial and error, you find that this is equal to 4. Similarly, B is equal to 3 to the Y, which is equal to 27. Y comes out to be 3. For question 15, I'm throwing the coin four times. I want the probability lands heads three times exactly, which means I want three heads and one tail in any order, so I've got the following possible combinations. For each of these combinations, I need to find the probability, which is equal 0 0.3 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.3 times 0 0.7 in any order. To make this more clear, let me color code it. And note that this is the same product appearing four times so in order to add those, I will just say 4 times 0 0.3 to the power of 3 times 0 0.7, which comes out to be 0 0.0756. For part B, I need the probability that the coin will land heads at least once. So any combination with 4 heads, 3, 2, or 1, 
satisfy this condition. The only combination that doesn't satisfy this condition is the probability of four tails. So let's calculate this first and subtract it for, from 100%. So probability tails, 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 tails is equal to 0 0.7 to the power of 4. So probability heads at least once is equal to 1 minus 0 0.7 to the power of 4, which is 0 0.7. 0.7599. For question 16, of course, some people going for swimming or basketball or the gym. So this is the information. Let's try and transfer this on the diagram. So the triple intersection of the center is 2. Then swimming and basketball only is equal to 3 minus 2, which is 1. Basketball and gym only is equal to 5 minus 2, which comes out to be 3. Swimming and gym only, this is equal to 7 minus 2, which is 5. And then let's start with the outside circle. So I've got swimming only is equal to 28 minus 1 and 2 and 5 comes out to be 20. Basketball only is 16 minus 1 and 2 and 3, which is 10. And then gym only is equal to 27 minus 5, 2 and 3, which comes out to be 17. Now, if you subtract 120 minus everything else, it comes out to be 62. For part B, we are given that one of the people who went swimming is chosen at random. So my denominator is one of those people that's 28. And out of those 28, I need to see what's the probability of picking one who also played basketball. Now, out of those 28, these three also played basketball. So my answer would be 1 plus 2 over 28. That's 3 over 28. For part A, I need to find upper and lower bounds for E and F. Now E is between 4.75 and 4.85. F is between 0.255 and 0 0.265. Now I need to find the lower bound for P. And this is equal to the product of the two lower bounds. So I've got 4.75 times 0 0.255 comes out to be 1.21 to three significant figures. For part B, I'll find upper and lower bounds for T and W as before. So T is between 2.725 and 2.735. W is between 0 0.035 and 0 0.045. Now I need to find the upper bound of Q. To find the upper bound of Q, I need the numerator to be as big as possible and the denominator to be as small as possible. So upper bound of Q is equal to 2.735 over 0 0.035, which comes out to be 78 to two significant figures. For question 18, I have the graph of y equals sine x between 0 and 360. I need to sketch the graph of y equals sine of x plus 90. This is a translation by 90 degrees to the left. So let's move this by 90 degrees to the left. Note that the final graph should be between 0 and 3 
60. So let's take some points on this graph and let's translate those points by 90 degrees to the left. Let's join those points with a smooth curve so we can have our translated graph. Now note that the final graph, the red one, should be between 0 and 360. So I don't need this part here, but I need this extra part between 270 and 360. Something is missing from there. Now to figure out what's missing from there, basically I have to continue my graph. So this part should actually be here. So let's erase from the left and redraw to the right. So this is how the final graph should look like. For part B, I need to write down the coordinates of the maximum point of this graph. Now note there are two transformations on this graph. Inside the bracket, I have x over 2, which means I have a multiplication of the x coordinates by 2. And the plus 3 means that I add 3 to the y coordinates. So, if on the original sine graph the maximum is 91, then on the new graph the maximum should be 90 times 2, which is 180. And then for the y, it's going to be 1 plus 3, which will be 4. For question 19, I will use the sine rule and the formula for the area of any triangle. These formulae are given at the back of the cover. I will then split the quadrilateral into two triangles. Now, to find the area of the blue one, first I'll need to find the size of side BD. Now, I'll use the sine rule for that. So I've got A over sine A equals to B over sine B, which means A over sine of 97 is equal to 9.3 over sine 58. If I cross multiply, A comes out to be 9.3 sine 97 over sine 58. So A is equal to 10.8846176. Then, to find the area of the blue triangle, I'm going to need this angle here. So, A, D, B is equal to 180 minus 97 and 58, which is equal to 25. So, the area of A B, D, that's the blue triangle, is equal to 1 over 2 A, B, sine of angle D. This is equal to 1 over 2, 10.88 times 9.3 times sine of 25 is equal to 21.3901. 774 and then I'll proceed to find the area of the red triangle so area of B C and D is equal to 1 over 2 C times D times sine of B which is equal to 1 over 2 10.88 times 11.2 times sine of 47. This is equal to 44.578829.96. So the total area is equal to the sum of the two areas, at 65.969 and so on which is 66.0 to three significant figures. 
In question 20, part A, I'll need to complete the square. The formula for completing the square is the following. In order for this formula to work, the coefficient of x squared must be equal to 1. So I'll start by taking out a common factor of 3 from the red expression. So I'm going to get 3 x squared minus 4x close the square bracket plus 7. Now note, I have not completed the square yet. I've just set it up so it's ready for completion. Now I'm going to focus on this blue part here and if I follow the formula I will get x squared minus 4x is equal to x minus half of 4 squared minus 2 squared. This can be simplified as x minus 2 squared minus 4 and then if I plug this back into my original expression I will get 3 square bracket x minus 2 squared minus 4 close the square bracket plus 7 now I'm going to expand this square bracket not the x minus 2 bracket so I will get 3 x minus 2 squared minus 12 plus 7. Hence, my final answer will be 3x minus 2 squared minus 12 plus 7 gives me minus 5. And this is my final answer. For part B, I use the following fact. If I can write an equation in the form y equals a x plus p squared plus q then the vertex is at the point minus p q and since I've written my equation in this form then I can extract the coordinates of the vertex from this equation so in our case we've got minus minus 2 that's a positive 2 comma minus 5 and the line of symmetry is the vertical line that passes through the vertex. Hence, x equals 2 is the equation of the line of symmetry. In question 21, I'll first need to solve simultaneously the two equations in order to find the points A and B. Now, let's first expand this blue equation. y equals to 10x squared plus 10x minus 3x minus 3. So y is 10x squared plus 7x minus 3. Then I will rearrange the red equation y is equal to 6x and then I will substitute and solve simultaneously. So I get 10x squared plus 7x minus 3 is equal to 6x. So 10x squared plus x minus 3 is equal to 0 by taking the 6x to the left. Now I will factorize this expression. You can use the quadratic formula if you want or completing the square. When I factorize I get 5x plus 3 and 2x minus 1 is equal to 0. So x is equal to minus 3 over 5 or x equals to 1 over 2. Now to find the y values, I can substitute these two x values either in this blue equation or the red one. Much easier to go with the red one. So y is 6 times x, so it's minus 18 over 5, or y is equal to 6 over 2, which is 3. So my two points are a minus 3 over 5 minus 18 over 5, b is equal to half 3. The order of labeling does not make any difference. Now, to find the midpoint, the formula I'm going to use is the following. So let's substitute the values from above. For the x-coordinates, I get minus 3 over 5 plus 1 over 2 over 2 and then for the y's minus 18 over 5 
plus 3 over 2. You can put this on the calculators and the answer will be minus 1 over 20 and minus 3 over 10. You can give your answers as decimals or fractions. Both are correct. For question 22, I'll first need the formulae for the area of a sector and the length of an arc. Um, given that the ratio OA to AP is 3 to 2, so I can assume the following. The radius OA is equal to 3x, so the radius of OP is 3x and 2x equals to 5x. And since I'm given the area of the shaded region, then I can subtract the area of the big sector minus the small one and equate this to 81 over 2 pi. So let's begin. Area of the shaded region is the area of the big sector, the one in red, 45 over 360 times pi r squared. The r I'm going to use is equal to 5x minus the area of the blue sector, 45 over 360 times pi r squared with r being 3x. Now the area is given as 81 over 2 pi. Now if I expand these brackets, I'm going to get 25x squared and 9x squared respectively. So 45 over 360 times 25 pi x squared and then pi times 9x squared. And now let's use the calculator to simplify these numbers. 81 over 2 pi is equal to 25 over 8 pi x squared minus 9 over 8 pi x squared. And if I subtract 25 over 8 pi minus 9 over 8 pi, I'm going to get 16 over 8 pi, which simplifies to 2 pi x squared. Now I'm going to divide both sides by 2. So 21 over 4 pi is equal to pi x squared. I can cross out the pi's now, so x squared is equal to 81 over 4, which means that x is the square root of 81 over 4, which is 9 over 2, or just 4.5 centimeters. Now that I have found the value of x, I can work out the perimeter and the perimeter is equal to two arcs and two straight lines. So I have the arc PQ in red, the arc AB in blue, and the two straight lines AP and BQ, each one being 2x. So let's go and work out the perimeter. So we've got the big arc, 45, over 360 times 2 pi and the radius is 5x plus the small arc 45 over 360 times 2 pi times the radius which is 2x plus 2x plus 2x for the two straight lines. Now, we found x to be 4.5, so let's substitute this into my formulae. 45 over 360 times 2 pi times 22.5, that's the value for 5x, plus 45 over 360 times 2 pi times 13.5, that's 3x, plus, and then I have 4x's, each one being 4.5, so I've got a total of 18. Now, if I put this on the calculator and each one separately, I'm going to get 
45 over 8 pi plus 27 over 8 pi plus 18. And then if I add the first two terms, I'm going to get 9 pi plus 18. And this is my final answer. For question 23, I'll need the formula for arithmetic sequences. The formula for the sum of n terms is given at the back of the cover. The formula for the nth term is a plus n minus 1d. Now I've got two pieces of information. I'm going to use them to create two simultaneous equations, solve them, and find a and d. So the first one I'm given is that the 10th term is 66. So let's work with this. A plus n minus 1 d is equal to 66. So A plus, since I'm talking about the 10th term, I've got 10 minus 1 d is equal to 66. So A plus 9 d is 66. Then I'm going to use the second statement that the sum of the first 20 terms is 1290 and create another equation using the formula for the sum. I've got 20 over 2, 2a plus n minus 1, so 20 minus 1, d, this is equal to 1290. Let's simplify 10 times 2a plus 19d is equal to 1290. And if I divide by 10, I'm going to get 2a plus 19d equals 129. Now I can multiply the first equation by 2 and get 2a plus 18d equals 132 and I can solve these two simultaneously by subtracting the two a's disappear d is equal to minus 3 and I can substitute this d into any equation I'll select this one it's the simplest so I get a plus 9 times minus 3 equal to 66 so a minus 27 66 a is equal to 66 plus 27 is equal to 93 finally I can go on and find the fifth term which is what I'm asked to do so fifth term equals and I'm going to use the formula a plus n minus d again that's 93, we found a plus 5 minus 1 times minus 3. And if you put this on the calculator, you will get 81.